This is a Philips CDI interactive CD player video game system. Came out long time ago. Um, this one has a particular problem. We'll turn the power on here and you'll be able to figure it out what it is right away. Ooh, that sounds good. And it doesn't close all the way. And to top it off, when you put in a disc, I've got my, my Richard Scary's busiest neighborhood disc ever disc. If I put that in, it doesn't even sound like it's spinning. It's, it's just not doing anything. I don't even think it, it realizes that the, the disc is closed, but it's just not doing anything. But let's, uh, let's open it up and see what we find inside. All right, she's got five screws. There's two on this side, two on this side, and three along the back edge here, right there. And you can see the CD drive actually even starts to fall open when I lift the machine up. So definitely probably needs a belt replacement. Oh, and it uses little torque screws. So T9 across the back. And looks like it's also the same on the sides. This thing is bloody heavy. Let's put the test disc in again and see if it actually spins. No, that feels really tight. Doesn't look like the laser is working though. It looks like it's trying to move. Okay, so to get the, the CD drive out, uh, which will let us take the front plate off and everything, there's two screws in here, also Torx 9, but you have to slide the tray forward and there are two screws down past the tray in here. Just gonna feel for it, there we go. Also Torx 9, but you have to have a long skinny screwdriver in order to get down to them. Yeah, there was a cable underneath. There we go, got the tray off. So we're gonna clean the laser uh, and I already took the belt off. So we're gonna take the, we're gonna swap out a new belt. So the laser is down in here. Uh, most drives nowadays don't have this big, big bar that's actually attached to the lid of the drive. But this one is a little bit of a different design. So a uh, little IPA, little 99% isopropyl alcohol. Reach in there, just kind of dab gently with a cotton swab on the laser and then we'll let it dry. And we'll just kind of wipe up the ex excess alcohol with, another, with the other end of the swab. Or to uh, switch the belt, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna clean off these gears here just to make sure that there's no residue on them or anything. Those are moving pretty smooth. 
Now, the problem with the drive not spinning the disc, and I've seen this on more than one occasion with these drives, is if you see in here, let's see if I can get a good shot of it. So this little spot here, that's the spindle, the under drives, the under the spindle for the disc. So this ends up getting squished too much onto the actual platter of the laser assembly. So it can't spin anymore. And if I try to spin it with my finger, it's, it's super hard to turn. It just doesn't turn. So my guess is, is that this one, just like a lot of other uh, CDIs, has had its laser squished and it just needs to have its laser pushed back up a little bit. See, already, can't even see it. So we'll pry it up a little bit with an X-Acto knife and already it's moving a lot easier than it was before. Okay, so we'll pried it up. Now it's spinning freely. And I've actually got some space in between the disc, the, the metal housing of the laser assembly, and the actual spinning platter. Wonder if that would be it. But let's find a new belt first. I'm gonna say this one is probably gonna be a good choice. Yep, I think so. All right, so just to show you, see if you can see, now you can sort of see, if I turn it there, you can see that there's blue in between the spindle and the pla on the actual housing of the laser. So that is allowing this to actually spin freely now. There's like no friction there whatsoever. So let's see if we can uh, put this back together enough to try it. Hardest part's going to be getting this, uh, this ribbon cable back on the board. There we go. I think that's in. Oh yeah, I gotta put. Guess I gotta put that tray back in, huh? The disc is back on temporarily. Drive is all the way in. Let's uh, hook up some power and see what happens. Oh, that's spinning. Never did that before. Oh, that's good to see. All right, well, let's... Uh, still a little noisy. Maybe I need some... Uh, Lithium grease on those, uh, on the track there. Where did I put my disc? So I got it to read CDs pretty consistently, but yet it still refuses to read this actual CDI disc. But then I got to thinking, what if it needs the piece that I took out of here? What if it needs this, which is the c digital video cartridge? in order to decode some of the data that's on that disk. Maybe it can't recognize it without it there. So let's uh, go and try and put that back in. Has little latches, little things that it hook onto in the front. All right, let's give this a test. Disc is in, and away we go. Hey, it actually says play CDI. Let's see what it does.
nice. I don't think I'm ever going to play this game, but you know, hey, it's working. The device is working. I have managed to fix one of the worst consoles in the history of the world. So the next thing we need to fix on the Philips CDI is the real-time clock battery. Um, I was expecting to find one of the, you know, Dallas real-time clocks or one of the, or the clock chips where you have to hack it open and swap out the battery, uh, which is a terrible design. They actually embedded the battery inside of the chip, which is just terrible. I don't know why you would even think of doing that. Um, but instead I found this, which is a different version of the same thing. So this is the, this is the, uh, the chip here. This is the RAM chip that holds all of the settings for the, for the unit and everything. The battery is actually underneath in the socket. But it looks like, from what I've read, that this might actually be an easier fix. This is not a common one that you usually find on this type of unit. This is a 210 or a 220. Um, this one is, uh, the battery is actually inside the base down in here. Uh, so we can take the chip out. So as soon as I pop this RAM chip, it would, I would lose all of my settings, but it's not like I had any anyway, cause the battery doesn't work. So the battery is actually underneath this chip here. And there are potentially two batteries underneath, one connected on pin four of the chip and one connected on pin 14, I believe it is. Yeah, so there's a battery at pin four and potentially a battery at pin 14 of the chip. So that is, uh, pin four is right there and pin 14 is uh, one up on the other side. Now, I took some multimeter readings and did not find anything there. Nor did I find, uh, I didn't find any voltage at all. And nor did I find a, the four, pin 14 was not connected to ground. So you can hear the beep. In meters in continuity mode. So pin 8 is ground. And if there is no second battery... Pin 14 should have been connected to ground, but it is not. Now, a couple of instructions that I've read for, for this type of battery. One said you could, you have to tear the whole thing apart, disconnect the old battery, and all that kind of stuff. But then there was another one that just said you can run it in parallel. And you can just hook the battery up to pin 14 and pin 8 and just hook up a, a 2032 socket and away you go. So that's what I'm going to try and see if that works. So we're just going to solder up a couple of wires to pins 14 and to pin 8. And then hook it up to a socket and see if that just works.
Okay, we got the wires back and the wires are installed. The chip is back in. Uh, let's just do a quick power on and make sure that we didn't blow the whole thing up. Okay, that's good. So it still works. Now let's hook up the battery socket and go from there. Well, I'm glad I put some uh, length of wire on there because what I forgot was is that the expansion bay part has to sit over top of the chip. So I was going to just put the battery right on top, but then I was like, I can't because this is right on top. Uh, so I ran the good thing. I put some extra length of wire. So I'm going to put the battery socket, just going to double sided tape it to, to the RF adapter there. But I've got the two wires out and tinned. And here is my battery socket. Uh, negative is on the bottom here and positive are either one of these two pins on the top. So let's just go ahead and get that soldered on there. Having a hard time doing this this morning. Let's see if it saves settings now. Let's just give it a try. Okay, so let's go over to options. Time and date. Okay, well, here's the big test. Let's turn her off. We set the date and time on it. I'm going to pull the plug. Plug it back in. Turn it back on. And the time and date saved. Excellent. So that means we can set some other options. Like turning on autoplay. Oh, it even has a 16 by 9 display option. Okay, so now if we go open and we put our disc in, it should 
just load. And this thing is totally working now. Let's uh, get this thing all put back together and give it a little wipe down, a little clean. There we go, a Philips CDI 220 lovingly restored back to working condition so that future generations can look at its crappiness and go, wow, that was a terrible idea for a console. Anyway, that's it for this video. Now I'm going to go try and see if I can find a copy of that really crappy Mario and really crappy Zelda games for this thing <laughs> and not play them. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next video. Later.